to the Isaac Show. Um, great to be here again with you guys. Um, so today we'll be talking about health. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, health is a very, very paramount thing in our lives. Um, and of course, with this COVID-19 situation that is sweeping or that has swept through the world, uh, people are having to deal with new realities, you know. So today, basically, we'll be delving into that sector. Um, more importantly, we'll be talking about critical opportunities that you and I can take advantage of at such a time as this, you know. Um, I did some reading up and in my research, in my little research, I found out that based on statistics, uh, most African countries actually spend less than 10% of their GDP on healthcare and fewer than 50% of Africans actually have access to modern health facilities you know that shows huge gap across um, africa's health sector actually you know and then um when we talk about health across africa access actually remains one of the biggest challenges you know when it comes to health in africa so today we'll be having someone who is um <laughs> a major disruptor in that sector across the african continent Welcome, Akoswa. Oh, our guest is actually here already. So we're going to bring her right in. Guys, how are you doing today? Good to see you guys. Okay, so we have um, Miss Folake Odejiro live. Good afternoon, ma'am. <laughs> Good afternoon, Isaac. How are you? I'm very well. Good afternoon. How was your week? Fine, thank you. And you? I'm awesome. I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thank you so very much for sharing your time with us today. Thank you for choosing to do this. Thank you for choosing to share. And thanks for the amazing, amazing work that you do. Thank you so very much. Okay, so um, I'll quickly go through... Um, Miss Folakes profile uh, so that we can dive straight into this. Yes, yeah, so she's the country lead of um, Sanofi Nigeria and Ghana. Um, um, she holds a bachelor's degree in um, uh, pharmacy from the Amadou Bello University, uh, master's of science in marketing from Edinburgh Business School, you know, and she also has a master's of, um, I mean, an MBA from Lagos State University. She has over two decades of broad experience in the pharmaceutical industry, which spans general management, strategic leadership, sales and marketing management, business development, commercial leadership, you know, to drive success across a variety of therapeutic portfolios and beyond borders. Um, she's a dynamic leader with a frame of management that liberates the energies within a system. She believes in empowered and accountable teams with a track record of outstanding performance and leadership in diverse roles of increasing importance. Um, currently, the general manager, general medicines, and country lead for Sanofi in Nigeria and Ghana. She leads the Nigeria and Ghana team at Sanofi, working together in a common purpose to empower lives, helping patients and people on the healthcare journey. Um, prior to joining Sanofi, she worked at uh, um, Pfizer, Global Pharmaceuticals, and uh, Astra, Zenica in various roles of increasing responsibilities with a strong record of results and accomplishments. Well, that's basically to put the profile um, shots. Um, um, in a nutshell, she's very passionate about God and inspiring greatness in others. So welcome once again, um, Ms. Falake, and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you for having me, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I would like to start with your story. Um, I know a little about it. I won't say I know everything, but I also know that um, um, the health sector is one of those sectors that I actually keep a watch on, especially in Nigeria. Um, and it's so, it's so instructive that um, you happen to be one of the very few females who are actually leading um, um, the disruption game in that sector you know so um how would you say this has been for you you know being a woman 
and uh, of course leading teams effectively um, across the companies you've worked for so far. How has the experience been generally before I begin to ask you um, very direct questions? So thank you, um, Isaac, once again. Thank you for having me. And um, I guess it's good evening, everyone. Um, um, I guess we're, uh, yeah. um, it's been an exciting journey, I dare say. Um, yeah. A very challenging one, if I must add. <laughs> but, uh, by and large, it's a great privilege to lead teams. And if you recognize, awesome. if you recognize that human beings are just beautiful, if you, if you recognize that it's, it's, a, it's a huge honor, to have the privilege of harnessing potential within within a frame or within a system, you will know that it's been an exciting ride. It's not without its challenges, but again, the opportunities are within the challenges. Yeah, so the yeah. beauty is in the pain. <laughs> if I can put it that way. Um, okay. It's been two decades, as you read from my profile, of working with teams, working yeah. across borders, working across therapeutic um, um, areas. Uh, there's, yeah. a lot, there's been a lot of high and lows, so it's not been an exotic ride. Hard <laughs> <laughs> um, work is not exactly exotic, yeah? But mm -hmm. it's, it's pockets of uh, adversities here and there, but also pockets of victories. Uh, pockets mm -hmm. of challenges here and there, but also pockets of wins. So generally, mm -hmm. again, because it's, a broad, because it's a broad question you will ask, yeah. I'll say it's yeah. a great privilege to lead teams across the various places where I've worked especially to lead the team at Sanofi in Nigeria. Awesome. Okay. So um, now I'll start um, straight up from the beginning. So um, when you started out after school, um, of course, you went to Amado Bello University, uh, if I'm right. And then so after school, what exactly was on your mind? What did you want to do with your life uh, at that point? Did you, did you set out to become um, uh, a health professional at the start? And um, well, I mean, if not, what was the um, most important um, goal in your mind as at that time when you graduated? And what, what, what did you want to do with your life as at that time? Hmm. But, um, clarity. Clarity always reveals itself with action. Mm. Now, I know what I mean. When I started out, I wasn't exactly sure. <laughs> <laughs> what I wanted to do, or how I, would, I, would, I, I would be very sincere with that. But I was, I was burning, which means I was very passionate about the few things I could do. So yeah. one of the very few things that I could do when I started out was that I was good at talking. And um, mm. because I'm a pharmacist by training, uh, our tr our, the pharmacy training requires that you go through a one-year mandatory internship before the national okay. youth call. Aside that, the pharmacy training also um, encourages that you have some degree of industry knowledge, which means you work in the hospital if you can, and with, within pharmacy outlets. So I found yeah. myself uh, in a pharmacy outlet somewhere in Ibadan, and all I do was just to, to dispense drugs over the counter. In our, in our client, we call it... Uh, you were selling drugs, but again, it was in a pharmacy shop. My pharmacy out there. Okay. What I want to highlight is not so much the dispensing, but the attitude with which I did the dispensing. So mm. I was a lot of counseling, a lot of talking, a lot wow, of dispensing. engagement, a lot of interaction, because that was what I know how to do. So sometimes when we're trying, uh, the journey of the thousand miles begins with a step, and sometimes we worry too much about the destination. But I think mm. the present also matters. We really do need to focus on the present. So I was doing a lot of talking and some person saw me and said, you know what? You will be very good as a medical rep. Now, medical representation is um, it's a level you can start your career at within the pharmaceutical uh, side. Okay. That was how I, I got encouraged, I applied for a role, I got the opportunity, and here we are today, 20 years now. So really, what I want to highlight um, um, based on that question you asked is, did I really know how things were going to pan out? Not exactly. But okay. I, 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 what my hands found to do, I did very well. And it very took well. some other person. It took um, a co-worker, if you may, or someone yeah. that I was working with to say, you know what, I've recognized this and why don't you go here? What that tells you yeah. is that it's one thing for you to have talent or to be gifted in an area, but it will yeah. take multiple stakeholders sometimes 
to help you really find clarity. But more importantly, mm -hmm. more importantly, after I got into the sector, I didn't run away from the challenges within the sector. I think that is critical. Uh, a lot yeah. of times we, we don't actualize our dreams because we quit, we quit so early or too quickly. So within mm -hmm. the sector, I stayed put. I, I, I stuck it out, <laughs> if you may. I had grace to stick it out. And probably that's why we are where we are today. So it's a long journey. I mean, the journey is still on, but um, a lot of lessons gained, if you ask. Amazing. Me. Okay, so someone spotted you um, while you were dispensing and it's, I mean, I mean, noticed your exceptional ability um, at talking, you know, at speaking, and then advised you to take a course of action. So what did you do um, at that point? Was it, was it this person that sponsored um you're having to go through the um course that you had to you had to do at that point but what were the exact steps that you took okay, after this you. To you? yes i remember that i already graduated as a pharmacist yeah so i was working at this facility i, I wanted to save our time but let me take a bit of the story i was working at okay. this facility but i was working passionately so i i threw the whole of myself into the in, into the space that has been given to me and that space was yeah. to dispense and to cancel patients so a superintendent pharmacist at that facility squad pharmacy that's the name of the outlet then in Ibado, saw that i had yeah. unique abilities of i was doing my work and i guess the owner of the premise also noted these abilities i needed to follow this story train and yeah. then someday the owner of the premise went for some sort of annual pharmacy conference yeah. He met an old classmate of his. Okay. Who, who then was an MD of the company where I started working. And he was bragging. About, yes, he was bragging about this young girl, uh, uh, graduate that he has in his outlet who will not stop talking. And who since they have gotten out on board, uh, their, their customer base has increased and they are selling. Wow. Increasing. So my boss kind of bragged with me if you know what I mean. He bragged with me and his friend said, you know what? We're looking for those kind of people as medical representatives. Give her my card. Mm. But mm. my boss did not give me that card. He <laughs> shared that story. <laughs> he shared that story with that co-worker, with that superintendent pharmacist, like our senior. But the yeah. other person felt, no, this girl deserves more than just dispensing drugs across the counter in a pharmacy. Yeah. So later, in, after my boss had gone out of uh, the facility, or when I, after he had gone out, this superintendent pharmacy called me and said, you know what? There was a discussion about you. This, this, this was what the boss shared with me. Would you be interested in medical mm. representation? Now, the truth is, I didn't know much about that. About and probably that's another principle. Yeah, so of opportunity usually doesn't come labeled as opportunity. A lot mm. of it is unknown. It's unknown. Absolutely. It's okay to take risk. It's okay to, to, to take a, a, a big jump into the unknown. Yeah? yeah. I didn't know much about this world of life, but two things were, 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 were interesting to me that it involves talking and that I will have mm. opportunity to counsel. I didn't know then that what I was going to do is have opportunity to talk about medication and talk about mm. uh, products for the organization I work for. So this um, senior uh, superintendent pharmacy offered to write me a CV because I didn't have one. So that's another thing. The support system that you need sometimes is not just your friends or family. Sometimes the support system you're looking for is at work. Is at that mm. place where you think you are managing or you are pitching. If you don't maximize those relationships, you lose the opportunity of being helped. So he offered to write me a CV. He wrote me a CV. He submitted the CV. <laughs> Wow. Because I didn't know much about Ibadan. I grew up in the north, so I didn't even know okay. where the post office was. Okay. I said, you know what? On my way home, I would drop it at the post office. That was all. A week after that, I got someone to come to Lagos. That was the first time ever I was going to be in Lagos. It was my first interview as, um, as a graduate, as a young graduate, and I got the opportunity. So again, um, a, lot, a couple of elements. I mean, you could talk about favor. You could talk about positioning. You could talk about community. But more importantly, more importantly, there was a will, yeah, yeah, and there was an opportunity, yeah. and, and and both worked together. So that was why I got into the sector. And after I got into the sector, I realized that it was something that I like. So you see, sometimes you're not clear, 
But as you get in and you begin to do, you get clarity. And that was why I said mm. clarity comes with it action. It itself with it action. It comes with action. So as I got into it, I, I, my, my perspectives got broader. I got more clarity and I stayed on amazing 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 okay so um of course i personally won't forget that clarity reveals itself with action actually yeah because um a lot of the times it's until you actually take that step that you then realize the uh how important that step was really was in the first place yeah okay so um so so you you you, you got the opportunity you got the offer you came to lagos how long did you work in that organization and what was your experience like you know, um, during that period. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> so I worked in that organization for five plus years, five years and a couple of months. Of course, awesome. I was a beginner. It was my very first opportunity um, on any role at a job. I didn't yeah. know Lagos. I had never been in Lagos before. I was born in the northern part of Nigeria and I schooled in the northern part of Nigeria. So you can imagine yeah. what it was. And, and we're talking, we're talking about. Um, um, 2000, 2001. Mm. So what company was it? Yes. So I didn't know Lagos had, had, had never been in Lagos. What was the opportunity like? It was unclear. Mm. I remember I used to, I would come back from work some days and I'll be crying. So, so when, so when you got to Lagos, actually, sorry, let me, let me, let me quickly add this to the question. So when you got to Lagos, where did you stay? What was the name of this company, you know? And um, yeah, <laughs> how was the whole experience for you? Okay, interesting. Okay, so when I got to Lagos, I stayed at... Um, what's the name of this place now? Um, so you didn't have a family to stay with? You had to, no, so you had no, to no, get no, no. I didn't have a family to stay with. I had wow. to stay with um, a distant cousin who wasn't around, okay. who had gone to South Africa then, but whose wife was a nurse and who was staying at it. Is it Abulia Egba? Yes, Abulia Egba. Wow, <laughs> so really? I, <laughs> I said that I'm really bad with this, uh, I know I'm bad very well. With the wife of a distant person. And, and really, that's where I'm going to. And sometimes I come back from work. My office was at Ikeja. This company was AstraZeneca, but it was being represented okay. in Nigeria by Reels. So sometimes I'll come okay. back from work in the evening. Of course, I had a company car that I didn't know how to drive. So I had to wow. get a driver who was far bigger, fatter than me, taller than I was who understand the terrain, who every minute okay. he tells me, Madam, if you disturb me too much, I'll pack your car. <laughs> ah. <laughs> you know, you know that kind of stuff. And I know sometimes when I get back from work and I get home, I'll be crying. And a lot wow. of times, I really didn't know what the chase was about. It wasn't even so much the pressure of the job, as much as the pressure of working in Lagos. And for me, that's, mm. another, that's another principle. So sometimes, as a young beginner, you need to be able to separate the issues. You need to mm. take out the complexity of the environment from the pressure of the job. Sometimes of the job. The, pre the pressure you're going through is from family. Sometimes it's the pressure of having to take a commercial bus. Sometimes it's the pressure of long distance. But you, you are so frustrated, and when your friends ask you, you keep saying, I don't like the job. It's not so much the job. Yes, there was a lot of pressure also mm. in the job. Because there were, there were aspects of the job that, that, that was very challenging. For example, um, I was living at Abuna Egba. My office was at Ikeja. And I had responsibility for territories that were based in Surulere, um, Bod um, Bag um, is it Bagada, um, Yaba, parts of Lagos that I naturally wouldn't have got to. I had to work in motion, you can imagine. So wow. in the midst of that chaos, the Lagos of 20 years ago, as a young person who was born in the north and raised in the north, one of the things, one of the challenges I needed to overcome was to go to those terrains to work. So there was also wow. the complexity of navigating the environment. And that was why that's I say, and, and that's, that's what brings me to honoring the struggle. So again, mm. part of getting to this place is going through all that and not quitting. Or mm. you, need, you will need more than, I don't know what to call it. You will need a bit, you will need some form of faith and grit. You will definitely need something to propel you for you to go through what, what you go through, especially as a beginner and not quit. Because when you are at that phase of your life, your work is not very remarkable. Or so it seems. Your work is not very noticeable. Not so stable, is, yeah. But yeah. actually, that's, that's when you build credibility. That's when you build character. 
that's when you build competence. And if mm. you will, that's actually when your journey to becoming starts. Because mm. when you see one challenge and you confront it, you become wiser and you mm. gain perspectives. And when you confront another challenge, you gain perspective. But that was then. That was the Abu Dhabi bad days. I moved from okay. Abu Dhabi to awesome. one estate. From Gawain Interesting. to Ikeja, now I'm at Alausa. So you see, <laughs> amazing amazing okay so this is actually um to, to really really help us um i just want to i, I want to I want, I want us to be able to get through the journey with you to see how it's happened you know what you have to go through you know and all of that so after that so you, you spent over five years on that particular role so when did you decide to leave what happened why did you leave you know to, um, to your next role how did the opportunity come and um why did you choose that okay um, um it was time for you to move on to the next assignment yeah okay good question um so so sometimes in life we are forced to make changes either from something that happens within us or something that happens externally. Around us, yeah. Around us, exactly. So my change was because of something that was happening around me, not was, was too, too prone. So something was happening within me. I'd been on a roll for about five years. Now, I wasn't so keen on being a manager as is the trend nowadays. It wasn't so much about the next title. It was about yeah. the next exciting opportunity. I was, it was becoming routine, doing the same thing for five years. Monotonous. I was looking for something that allows me to learn something new. The reason is because in the first two years of that role, I used to cry. By the fifth year, I stopped being a crying baby. <laughs> <laughs> so if there's any, any graduates that probably you're doing some part-time in a bank and probably yeah. in a meeting you find yourself crying, don't worry, you're not alone. And it's okay to mm -hmm. cry. Don't just, don't mm -hmm. just keep crying. Yeah? So in the first yeah. years of that role, I used to cry. In the first years of that role, I had a lot of emotional issues. I was very expressive. I, I wear my heart on my, on, my, on my sleeves. And I react to everything. But as, mm. as, I, as I stayed on the, on the role, I got mature. So I wanted something different. That's one. The second aspect of it is that the organization itself was going through a major restructuring. Remember I said I was working for AstraZeneca, but they were being represented in Nigeria then by Reels. So I think there was some attempt. There was some attempt for the parent company or the principal company to come fully back into the okay. area. And um, okay. the departure or the, the contractual agreement didn't really go well. And mm. the organization is still existing today, by the way, real, and they are doing very well. So a lot of people mm. started leaving. So there was this pressure of people that you've grown through the ranks with departing. But that's another learning. You cannot afford to quit a role because people are quitting. Because yeah. you are not on the same. Everybody is on his path, really. Yeah. So I, I, I kept on looking for something else to do. And in the five years that I had worked, I had built some credibility. And um, I, in my view, I think I did some remarkable work. And I don't know whether you believe this. I never applied for the second room, for the, for the next place that I got. Wow. So, so what happened? Retired, How did you happen? I, I went on holiday um, um, to Abuja then to meet my dear mom, who is late now. I went on holiday and I heard of an opportunity with GAIN, if you know, USAID jobs. So I, I attempted to get into, into those roles. I did very well with their routine interview, but I didn't do very well with the verbal, with the verbal interview because I didn't know much about pharmacy practice within the hospital system because it's been mm -hmm. a while since I left. And while I was still on vacation, um, uh, being a bit depressed over the fact that I didn't get that job, we got a phone call one day from Pfizer, which was the second place I went to. Mm -hmm. And the receptionist said, Madam, your bill uh, for like, is this for lucky? I said, Yes. I said, Well, we're expecting you for an interview. It's almost 20 minutes into the opportunity, into the session, and you're not here. And I said, wow. She said, Yes, it's a product <laughs> management interview. Your CV was supplied. Did you apply? And you know, in my name, where I was going to say, no, I didn't apply. And then my mom took the phone from me. And my mom said, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> something happened. She's not on ground. But please, because it was a Friday, if you can kindly reschedule, she will be in Lagos by Monday. OK, you had, gone back to, you had gone back to Knox at this time. Yes, yeah, just for holidays. I was just in holidays. I was still working. I was still working at this organization. OK, like OK. Said, OK. a lot was happening in the environment. People were quitting. But I didn't quit because I because of them, yeah. So, yeah. I went okay. on holidays, and this phone call came, 
and I had to, and my mom made this, my mom took the phone for me and said, oh, it's a mix-up, but if you can reschedule, she'll be around on Monday, and that was it. We spoke over, and I remember after that call, I kept on telling her, but I didn't tell you I want a job. We don't even, she said, try. Nobody mm. sees anything by trying. By trying. And maybe yeah. that's another thing. For, for the young levels, try. You never lose mm -hmm. anything by trying. So I found out that it was a product management role, which, was, which is actually like the next level and then relative to where I had been. And that was it. Yeah. So, but maybe the critical thing I would like to say here, by the, way, by the time I went for that interview, it was a three-stage interview. I was hired. Wow. I think for me, the most important thing was I did not, pre I did not, go f I did not prepare for that interview after the summon. The elements mm. that they required for that interview was learned in the five years that I was working. I think we make a lot of mistakes when we begin to prepare for the interview a week or a day after we have an opportunity. You need mm. to learn the rudiments for your next level in your current level. So while you're, while, while you're preparing for the tomorrow that you aspire to, you need to value today. And the, the, the way you value today is put in good work and make sure there's a better version of you. So that when the opportunity presents itself, you get it. So I went for that interview and I got it. So second opportunity, I didn't look for it. Somebody thought I could do it, it for it, and they gave it to me. And Amazing. I got the opportunity to be a product manager with Pfizer. And in that organization, I grew from product manager to group product manager to marketing manager before eventually I left that organization about seven and a half years later. The biggest learning for me while I was in Pfizer, among several other things, I think it was in Pfizer I learned how to embrace my struggle most, more than even in AZ. It was a difficult environment. Also because there was a time while I was in that place, while I had to do the work of probably two or three uh, um, uh, people. people, because one or two people left the system and the work needed to be done. And I did it. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. If you ever mm. find yourself in a place where <laughs> there's somebody's work and there's nobody to do it, even if they don't ask you, if you can, please do it. Because do that's it. when I tried to be on the curve. That was when I learned skills I never could have applied. By the time I got to this third place where I, where I currently am the GM, I came as a marketing head, head of marketing and sales. And so, this so, so, I was so, the general so, uh, so I was going to ask, ask you before we move on to the next place. Um, 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 you are at the very, very core. You're a medical person, right? But um, while you were at um, Pfizer, you took on the role of a marketing manager. So how were you, of course, and I know uh, the role of a marketing manager is, I mean, completely different from that of um, um, an healthcare professional. So how were you able to, you know, garner the skills to deliver on that role as a marketing expert? So maybe what I need to do, Isaac, for you and for the purpose of my listener, is to expand that the healthcare system is a huge value chain. Okay. And within the healthcare systems, you have different categories of capabilities and competencies and roles. So yeah. the health is not everybody that is a combat. For example, I'm a pharmacist by training, but I'm, an, I'm a pharmacist within manufacturing and industry. It's not every pharmacist that has to stay in the hospital. Yeah. So the okay. first role that I had was medical representation, which means it was a sales opportunity. It's just mm. that the kind of sales is not, it's not the typical merchandising kind of sales, but it's the kind of sales where they call it missionary selling, where you go to mm. hospitals and you, 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 provide or yeah. you provide information that is relevant to products that your organization uh, promotes to clinicians. So it's some form of selling, but what you're selling is knowledge, <laughs> if I okay. may, data. What you're yeah. selling is an opportunity to positively influence clinicians to avail themselves to, to varying degrees of medication that they can prescribe. So if there are, for example, one or two products that was available for a condition before, through your role, a doctor is able to know that there can be three, four, five, and he can explore. Your role is mm -hmm. to him to write. But yeah. finding is horizon. So this was the role that I had for five years. Now, beyond that role, within the pharma sector, that is what you call product management. So I graduated from promoting the product to designing the product. Let me explain what I mean. So I, I graduated from talking about the product 
to designing the, um, uh, uh, the information that others will talk about. I didn't design the product. Don't mind. Yeah. Those who design the product are in the manufacturing sector. They are in the industry. Yeah. But I put together the elements of communication that yeah. another set of people will use in talking about to market the product. product. So that, that's called brand management, essentially. So you see, within pharma sector, if you are in the industry, you can, yeah. you, you can be a marketeer. You can have um, marketing skills. So yeah. I did that for about three years. And then I became a manager of managers, which means I had other brand managers under me. And after that, I mean, working with me. And after that, I became a marketing manager. So it's, um, it's a graduated process of some sort. But how did I learn these skills? On the job. <laughs> On the job, essentially 70% on the job, but there is also about 30 to 20 percent that you learn from classroom and from reading online learning. One of the things yeah. the multinational organization does is it avails you a lot of opportunity to learn and to broaden your mm -hmm. horizon. And there's so much training, so much, so much under my belt for a lifetime. So that's one of the edge you get when you work for an organization that is global and is truly multinational. But aside that, all the skills that I acquired, I learned by doing. Yeah? So, mm. just, so mm. I graduated mm. from, from promoting products to designing any products that others will use for promoting the product. To promote the then product. I went from promoting products to designing communication to giving direction. Because in marketing, you are setting the direction. And I went yeah. from giving direction for, the, for a product to giving direction for the company. Because in my current role as general management, it's, it's strategic. So you see, it's not to, it's not direction for the product, but direction yeah. for the company. So now yeah, we need absolutely. the people who lead the people who lead the people who promote the product. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so now um, finally, before we move into um, the opportunities, um, which is also a very very uh, crucial conversation, um, I want to talk about how you, of course, how you moved from um, Pfizer to Sanofi. You know, um, of course, that was a major major move, <laughs> major major move. Right, so you spent seven years, over seven years at uh, Pfizer, um, having done a one fantastic job, and then you moved to Sanofi. Now, how did this movement happen? Were you handpicked? Were you appointed? Were you? I mean, what, what really happened? Can, can you can you give us that gist? Wow, <laughs> <laughs> I, I I resigned from Pfizer. Wow! In wow! Oh yes, I know you weren't expecting that in twenty fourteen. Um, in 2013, um, I think in October, uh, my mom died in a ghastly motor accident. Before wow. that, three years before that, my brother, he was a barrister, I was in his final year in law school, had died in an accident. But after mommy died, I think something broke in me. And after a while, even though you've grown resilience and adversity, there is so much you can handle with pain. Now, mm, combining yeah. that with the demanding role of a marketing manager was a little bit too much for me. Pfizer yeah. was a very challenging environment, as, as any, any uh, innovative organization would be. It's, it's a challenging context. However, why I really left was because I wasn't feeling challenged again in the role. Oh, no. And I was not sure whether it was because I was really tired of working or because of my personal loss. Sometimes you must have the courage to also assess the level of productivity you bring into an organization. I mm. think it's a case of I have the courage to move on. Okay, there's a spiritual part to me. I, 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 I'm not afraid to say I had a word from God to resign and I left. It okay. was tough and I, I was misunderstood by a lot of people because I had been seven years into Pfizer, had worked so hard. And for a lot of people in this, I mean, it was a well-paying job. Nobody understood me. Sometimes, mm. sometimes the strength we need for the next level must be a disruption. It was a major disruption, but I wasn't afraid. Mm. I, wasn't, I wasn't stretching any longer. I was a bit encumbered by grief. And unfortunately, uh, the system, I, I'm not blaming the system for this, but I didn't have anything to look towards again within the system. So I wow. resigned. I resigned because I thought I needed a few months to clear my mind. Yeah. But I left in May of uh, 2014, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. While I resigned, I had a program I was running then with Edinburgh. So I had the last exam. So I wrote that exam and I traveled. I traveled with whatever little savings I had. I just did it to clear my head. I was in the U.S. And then I came back from that trip. 
and I was at home and I fell ill. So between June, July, I was, I was ill. But while I was in the US, there's some funny person or some recruiter that was trying to, 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 <laughs> to reach me, asking for an opportunity, to say that there was an opportunity in another pharma uh, organization as marketing director. Trust me, I wasn't interested. I wasn't interested because I didn't have time. clarity around what I needed next. And yeah. I, I loved Pfizer. Pfizer was very close to my heart. And I just I didn't just want to take the first job that comes. That's another thing. If you don't know what you want, you will take anything really. So I didn't want to yeah. take just the first, first job. I really I wanted to know what is this resigning about. Um so like I said, I fell ill. And you know, when you're ill, you have time to think more. I was like that this this it was intermittent emails, you will not stop. So sometimes in yeah. July, I click the email. I, I mean, I, I, re I responded and I said, what exactly is this about? And he said, I saw your profile on LinkedIn. Five years plus in AstraZeneca, seven years in Pfizer. Pfizer, he, he thought I was still with Pfizer because it was just two months. Marketing director, I mean, manager in Pfizer. There's an opportunity for what we call franchise head, which is like marketing manager. I mean, director, not manager now. Director, yeah. Yeah. I'm interested in profiling you for this job. I am a recruiter. And I said, no, I'm not interested. And he said, please, we don't have too many people with that kind of profile. So wow. I got this current opportunity because a recruiter saw my profile on LinkedIn. And that was it. By the way, I didn't call myself what I was not. What I had on LinkedIn as at that time was just the barest minimum of who I was relative to my career journey. So I just mm. want to say that our work speaks, whether we agree or not. And mm. sometimes it will take people you know. Some other times it will just be some other person who, in the course of doing their own jobs, need you to fulfill their obligation. The recruiter needed pro, uh, candidates that 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 fitted a, a particular kind of profile, and I have yeah. to you. I went for yeah. that interview, and I got the job. So you see. Isaac, maybe among several people that have interviewed me, you're one of the first person to have been able to crack this journey. <laughs> but the truth is, my entire life since I graduated, I can't remember taking on any job on my own. I was looked wow. for, I was recommended, or somebody encouraged me. That was always a no. That's the truth. Wow. I can't remember the last time. No, 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 no. The only job I tried to get, I, to, to get into was gain USA ID, and I never got it. And that was because as at that time, I thought, okay, because I love to talk, if I could not get, if I was getting tired of AstraZeneca, I needed a monitoring and evaluation role, which yeah. allows me to continue to counsel. But I didn't get that opportunity. And everyone within the pharma came. So that's how I left. Um, remember, I was two months off Pfizer now. I went through the process. I started interview process for that role in a, about July of that year. By August, it was concluded. And by se September, I joined this organization. So I left Pfizer honorably. I quit it actually. <laughs> but I oh, closed wow. the door gently. Mm. And I spoke, even though I had left. I didn't bang the door on anyone. I needed to move on with my life. And sometimes also that's a mistake people make. We blame organizations for tragedies in our life. If you're tired and you're no longer productive, or if the organization is no longer meeting your aspiration, or yeah. if your own aspirations are bigger than the organization's aspiration, yeah. you need to have the courage to move on. I moved on, and another door opened. So um, four months after I left that place, I joined uh, my current organization. My current organization, I went in as franchise head. Six months after I joined them, I was redeployed. <laughs> Let me use that word. Into what we call business unit, which is director of sales and marketing. And then three months, three years after that role, I was asked by my boss, who was an expatriate, that I was, you know, the, the beauty of multinational is you, you are part of a talent pool. So I was told, yeah. you are part of a talent pool. Would you like to um, <laughs> apply for managing director? Role? They've never had a black. And I said, me. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, okay, it would be a great honor. If anything, at least I will know how, how they feel when they go for those interviews. I got it. <laughs> so again, wow. a lot of grace, and I'm grateful for it. But trust me, I never, like, currently, even though I've been, I've been a, a, an MG now for three, two years and about nine, nine months, I'll be three years in October. But trust me, my aspirations are clear. And as I'm talking to you, I'm already preparing for my next level. I have some ideas of what it is, but I don't also know what fate will throw at me. But I'm not waiting until I get the next level to prepare for it. So I'm stretching. I listen to an average of about five hours of podcast daily. Leadership, 
I subscribe to my things. I mean, I use my money, my funds to subscribe to things that help me. I don't waste time watching. Uh, I mean, I have no no problem with TV, <laughs> but I prioritize my 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 time because yeah, I'm for the next level, whatever that is. Yeah. Amazing! Wow, thank you so much. That was that was a lot of a lot of valuable information. Okay, so I, I want to talk about um, entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship. You know, what's what's your view, basically? Um, 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 you, I mean, and of course, for you also, what's 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 like the future in terms of your career? I mean, do you have plans to um, one day float your um, um, health organization, you know, so because I mean, what we talk about next level, what's like the next level for you personally, um, um, professional wise? Okay, so we've done a bit of a lot of talking about me. I'll come back to that, but maybe I should answer your questions <laughs> first around um, entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship, however you look at it. Yeah, my view, this is my perspective whether you're gonna work on your own or whether you're gonna work for someone whether it is private or public, you yeah. do need to have an entrepreneur mindset. I think that's what counts. We have this orientation of, um, of people who are working for themselves to think they are freer or better. Not necessarily. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. we have this uh, lopsided, lopsidedness of people who work for organizations <laughs> and who have paid income to think they are also better. The no. truth is the world is evolving. And if an organization keeps you, it's because you're relevant. For as long Absolutely. as you're relevant, the organization will pay a premium to keep you. If you Absolutely. stop being relevant, they're going to move on without you, especially now that Absolutely. the future of work has changed a lot. I think for me, whether you work for yourself or you work for an organization or you work for any parasitic, for that matter, or public, you need to have a mindset that creates, a mindset that brings value yeah. Continuous one adapt. A mindset that is willing to adapt to the changing climes, and a mindset that is willing to give whatever opportunity you have all it will take. If you have this mindset, I mean, there's a book by Carol Dweck that talks about the growth mindset. A mindset that believes that you can get better, you can learn more. That is a better way of doing it. If you have this mindset, whether it is on your job, whether it is on another person's job you make a success of it. So it's not so much about I'm working for myself. If you're working for yourself and your vision is narrow, if you're working for yourself and you do not place a premium on what you do, neither will your staff place a premium on what you do. If you're working for yourself and you do not place a premium on the customers that you're serving, you probably will not last long. So again, Personally, it's good to be to have something of your own because again, you can probably expand uh, wealth much more. But it's also good to work for for structured system because yeah. all the things that you need is already in place. It's just about uh, how you leverage and maximize it. So it's however you look at it. I'm comfortable working for systems. For now, this is where I found myself, and I'm just maximizing it. If the opportunity fantastic. comes to work in another capacity, I think what is more important is to build the skills to fit into that system. And that's what counts. Awesome. Uh, that's awesome. my aspiration. Yeah. It's huge. <laughs> it's <is> huge. <laughs> okay. We have very few female black CEOs. I yeah. Truly, I truly am not afraid to see myself as one in the near future. I do hope mm -hmm. I'm able to contribute positively to African narrative. I would love to be the CEO of a multinational organization. That's one of my long term aspirations. Mm. I also believe a lot in Nigeria and I believe a lot in Africa. I am not afraid to say if I have opportunity to serve within the public domain. Now I know that is tough waters. But sincerely, I, I, I have learned some things working in a multinational organization. And I think a lot of times what the public domain needs are reforms. And yeah. people who are willing to stick it out, who are almost my life, have nothing to lose, really. They have opportunity to serve in a public domain in, in a capacity that allows me to give all that I have learned over the years, I'll be happy to take it on. And last but not the least, if I have opportunity to serve for a better, for a greater good, which means maybe something that fulfills my spiritual yearning, if I can be a voice for the voiceless in some way, I'm an advocate of some sort, maybe not your conventional pastor, but if I can be a voice, I don't know how that plays out, I'll be happy to hit, hit that cause. These are some of my aspirations 
but there's still a lot of work to do. There's a lot of learning and a lot of learning and a lot of stretching. And I'm just, be I'm just beginning. Amazing. Wow. Thank you so, so, so very much. Okay. So um, I want to quickly talk. I think we have uh, about 15 minutes more. So, but I, I want us to talk really about um, the opportunities. I mean, COVID-19 has happened, um, disrupted, I mean, practically every, every industry, you know. So, um, but I also know that um, um, where, the, where there are challenges, there are opportunities, you know, especially at such a time as this where um, <clears throat> um, healthcare is being disrupted across the world. You know, so for, for a professional like you who has been there, done that, you know, across Africa's health sector, what would you say, you know, for, for um, impact investors, you know, that's number one, and secondly also for an average individual, what would you say are the, are the most pertinent opportunities right now, you know, um, across um, the health sector in Africa? Isaac, you've asked a very, very interesting but very deep question. Um, indeed, COVID-19 has, has happened and probably is still happening. Um, in my view, COVID-19 pandemic is a catalyst for change, probably more than anything we have ever seen. Mm. Probably more than yeah. anything we yeah. ever seen. Absolutely. Probably one of the one of the one of the one of the big changes that uh, this pandemic has evoked is our mind and what is possible with regards to the future of work. Who could have known that we can be locked at home for three months and work remotely, and the, yeah. world, and the whole world did not collapse? So it's amazing yeah. when we think some things are not possible. Uh, if I want to bring it back to healthcare, and if I want to narrow it a bit to Africa. The healthcare system, like I said at the beginning, is a huge value, value chain. But indeed, there are, there are several challenges. Now, first of all, you need to recognize that there are, are various sectors within the healthcare system. You have those who are involved with products, you have services, you know, and you have yeah. finances, yeah. you have products. Yeah. And within yeah. these sectors, there are industries and different companies. So if you're talking about yeah. products, for example, you're talking about biopharmaceuticals, you're talking about medical devices. You're talking about yeah. equipment, hospital equipment. If you're talking about services, maybe nursing service, physiotherapy, you know, all manner, lab diagnostics. And if, if you're talking about financing, you're talking about access uh, in terms of health. I think one of the opportunities that uh, COVID-19 has, um, has created is, firstly, it's good to establish that the healthcare system in Nigeria is weak. It's also important to establish that the infrastructures are weak. So we have systems that are weak. We have infrastructure that is weak. We have access that is poor. I mean, in, in, in our own, uh, in our nomenclature in pharmaceutical industry, they will tell you that in Nigeria, 97% of population pay out of pocket, which means um, medical care is not reimbursed. People pray from their pockets for their care. Yeah. I think COVID-19 yeah. has afforded opportunity to strengthen those systems. And one of mm. the ways we can strengthen those systems is by collaboration. I think young people, young people make a lot of mistakes when they think some things must be entirely from them. I give the example with vaccine. With the advent of COVID, so many big multinationals and organizations are partnering together and are collaborating to look for an agent that can be used as a vaccine. I think one of the ways we can leverage this is for any entrepreneur, anybody that is within the healthcare system to see how you support either what is existing or how you collaborate with someone to establish what is not there. Google yeah. does not have any information of its own, but it has the biggest information reserve. Yeah, they absolutely. Don't own any they don't own any inventory of vehicles, Uber. Yeah. But they have the biggest yeah. vehicular reserve in that, if you, if you may. Um, Amazon does not have good warehouses as it were, but you can, it, it has all the goods that you can think of. I think collaboration is the way to go. If you can start something of your own, whether within services or within, or you have products that you want to promote, or you, you, you have financial system, it's, if you cannot start something on your own, there are a thousand and one organizations that you can collaborate with to see yeah. how you strengthen what they are doing. Look at face masks. There are so many people now that are busy producing masks, you know? Um, um, hand sanitizers. I mean, just to come to the basic and minimum. So I think uh, COVID-19 allows people to look at what other opportunities 
really that they can explore. Look at digitalization. So a lot of people are now thinking for the for for my organization, even before the lockdown started in Lagos, we were locked down because we had a global direction to work from home. But we were, mm. we were working remotely. And just the way I'm talking to you and having this live chat, I was having Zoom calls sometimes for about eight to ten hours intermittently. I'm, I'm on a whole day, this whole day stretch. I'm in different yeah. Zoom meetings. We were consuming yeah. data. Yeah? We, we were yeah. sensitive about electricity for our teams. We were sensitive mm. about data and electricity. That is, that is a means of partnership. So you can work in healthcare and provide electricity or provide data without necessarily mm. providing medicines. So really Absolutely. it's about looking for where the gaps are. Uh, you, cannot, you cannot leverage what you don't know, Isaac. Yeah. You cannot leverage what you don't know. So really you want to maximize the opportunity that COVID has provided. You need to open your eyes to see the gaps that the pandemic has created. What are the gaps? that the pandemic has created and as you identify the gaps you look for what capabilities you have or what services or what products or what skills you have yeah. to close those gaps awesome awesome okay um um you, you mentioned something really very critical and that's about um access to health care you know um and how um almost 90 percent or more of the population actually pay from their pockets you know which is uh for me um it's a it's a major defect um for our for for us as a people and as a nation, you know. So, um, for you as an individual, what do you think? Um, how do you think we can solve this problem? Basically, you know, um, most people die. They, I mean, we, you, we find out that there are too many preventable deaths, you know, across board. You know, people don't have um, coverage, healthcare. Even some people that actually pay taxes don't have, you know. So, what what do you think we can do at the federal federal level? I mean, if if we if we had the opportunity to actually Effect this change. What are the pertinent solutions you think we can actually have to this uh, challenge? So access to I know our time is fast spent. Access to healthcare. If I want to use Nigeria as example, it, yeah. it's, it's multifaceted. So you have the, yeah. the challenge of accessing infrastructure in terms of whether there is even a health facility in the first place. So if yeah. you go to in some riverine areas in Nigeria, people have to travel several kilometers to assess a health facility. Even within exactly. Lagos, even within Lagos, you need to travel to assess health facility. So there is a challenge of health facility. Then there's mm. a challenge of the health workers. Mm. And yeah. then there's a yeah. challenge of the cost of payment of the medication. Of the medication. Um, I think um, one of the things we can, that government can do or that individuals can do, like I said, I go back to partnerships and collaboration. For example, people can partner with, with a particular state, with Lagos State, if I want to use it as an example, to say, okay, how, how many population do you, how many people within this state do you want to treat? For what condition? For every five people the state is willing to treat, individuals can say, I will support with this. I will provide this facility. My, my organization does some things. I don't want to go too much into that because this is not too much of a medical conference, you know, just yeah, yeah. So I think for me, collaboration and partnership between private and public sector can yeah. help us situate the healthcare. Because when mm -hmm. you talk about partnerships, you can partner to either donate structures or partner yeah. to reform structures or you Absolutely. can have partnerships to improve structures. Structures. Another partnership can be around financing. Around financing, as opposed to just putting your money in the bank and saving it. Can people save uh, 1,000 Naira every day so that when they have a sick son, they can access healthcare? Can you create mm -hmm. some kind of scheme or funds and you tell someone, just give me 1,000 Naira in a week. Just put yeah. it there and forget it. But if your child is sick, irrespective of the cost, we'll treat that child. Because it's a kind of uh, fund that you're pulling together. So there are many angles to this, and so many young people are running with different schemes, different uh, um, uh, innovation. There are so many parts of Nigeria that are not accessible by road, either yeah. because there is no road or no landmark. Is it yeah. possible for you to create some degree of telemedicine for people to be able to talk with doctors or talk with physicians by just using their mobile devices? Is it possible mm -hmm. for a sick grandmother in the village to assess adequate healthcare by talking to someone on phone. We call it telemedicine. So really, um, the question you have asked is not a five-minute question, Ola. <laughs> yeah, it is. Things, but I it's think not. Really, it starts with collaboration. 
It starts yeah. with identifying what the gaps are and it starts with a desire to really help. We're passionate to bring healthcare yeah. to millions of Nigerians and millions of Africa. We will support, we will collaborate and we will defend. Okay. Well, one, of, one of the greatest uh, things I find very unique about you is, is um, <laughs> and as much as this may sound a little uh, patronizing, is um, the unction with which you speak. You know, it's it's very it's you 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 can barely not want to listen. You know, um, <laughs> how did you? Where did you get that from? Is it a is it a family thing, or did you go to train in public speaking at some point in your life? You know, I mean, how how did you get that? Was I it from the north? I, I don't have any training in public speaking. And by the way, maybe I should not de- note that down and try and see if I can improve actually what I've got. I guess that's just me. Uh, maybe it's I wow. think it's just the way I'm gifted. I'm just wired. I I'm a very passionate person. Yeah. Uh, I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm a boundless enthusiast, and, and I just I give all of my heart. I I believe in in, in yeah. human beings a lot, and I and I give all of my heart to anything that I'm doing. But really, I don't have any special training with <laughs> with public speaking. It's just who I am, really. I'm Amazing. just that, by the way. I'm just trying to see how we strengthen what I've got here. Okay, so I'll ask you this question. I mean, we, I mean, we have um, barely three minutes to go. Um, would you consider joining a political party? Because um, at the end of the day, whether we like it or not, um, some of us have to step in at some point if any change, any kind of change is ever going to happen. Yes, we know we know we have some good people um, um, right there. But then, would you consider joining a political party? You know, at least to start. Um, to begin some conversations, you know, from, from there. Is, is that something you've considered or will consider um, at any point in time? Isaac, is this a setup? <laughs> it's not. Well, I mean, it's, it's a question that I've been on my mind, you know, especially. It's a yes, by the way. It's a yes. It's a yes. I think mm. for me, it's just a matter of when. Amazing. It's a yes, really. Um, when I was in the university, I was, the, there's what you call Pharmaceutical Association of Nigerian Student. I was a serving PRO and I was a serving secretary general. And really? probably those wow. were, when I was in VCI, and, and those were the first few attempts or um, whatever that I had uh, in, in politics. For now, I, I'm so much engrossed with my job, but trust me, it's, it's not, it's not, it's a yes, really. It's just what if some of us, what if some of us come to and pick you and pick you for the next election? I hope, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I hope you will, you know, we will have at that time, it will be, it will be like us, it will not be optional anymore. What to do, Isaac, if I'm unpicked for the next le- election? And by the way, re- remember that every sector requires some degree of preparation. What that will mean will be to put our heads down and begin to understand really what are the prerequisites and what are the things we yeah. need to put in place to make yeah, us sure. ready for the public sector really so Absolutely. why not, <laughs> mm, <laughs> why not? Mm, mm. awesome okay so um in in closing finally i would just like um if you could um i mean if you could there's someone out there who is a young um, person young woman young man you know who's just you know um um, getting started with their career, what would you, and of course, they want to reach lofty heights like you have, and probably even greater, what would you say to that person out there right now? So firstly, Isaac, thank you for having me, and thank you for all people that we have online, thank you for joining this chat. I just want thank to say you. that, don't let anybody tell you otherwise, you are unique and you're gifted. You're one of the several, um, several billion people on the surface of this earth, and you're beautifully so. You earn it to be on this side of eternity. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. That's one. Secondly, I want to let you know that you need to define what success means for you. Don't let mm. other people define your success. What does success mean for you? The reason is because if you define it, when you get there, you'll be able to identify it. If you do not define it, you'll keep looking for something that is elusive. You need to define what success means for you. You need to be sufficiently motivated and be willing to stretch out of your comfort zone. No world changer runs a normal schedule. You can't be sleeping and watching, <laughs> and watching Z World and thinking it, it doesn't work that way. You need, yeah. to, you, 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 you need to stretch beyond the limit. You need to have mm. a growth mindset. So when you were in school, somebody gave you the curriculum, biology, agri, and all that. Now you are an adult. Can you just design your own curriculum? Have a growth mindset and design what the next few phases of your life will look like. And then within your complexities are your opportunities. Please don't run away. Face it like with bravery. Stick it out. You know, have the courage to learn. 
honor your struggle, embrace it as if you're the only one that is going through. And just know that someday you have a valid story. By the way, if you run away from your challenges, you rob yourself the opportunity of a story. So own your wow. marriage, own your challenges, and stick it out with pride. I just want to say hard work pays, and there's nothing exotic about hard work. Trust me. Hard work is just the way it is. Hard work. I wish 